is designing Polar Park and how that process has been moving along? Well, we are at what is, we term the design development phase, which means our drawings are far enough along that it's past the concept which DIQ has established in the earlier schematic set with an idea of a steel frame building, sort of recalling uh, the, the, the armory and how beautiful that is. And we've done a lot of work on trying to make certain that this site really was reflected in the field dimensions and the seating bowl and how that comes together. And uh, at the moment, we're all holding our breath because it's out for pricing and we're eager to get a check on our, how we're doing relative to our budget. Uh, we feel good about the schedule because as you know, we started demolition on the site this morning and it's great to see Gobain Hunt out there with all the equipment and hear the humming and the beeping and all the, all the noises that accompany the orchestra of construction. Mm -hmm. When you said armory, uh, comparing to which, which armory? The um, the Higgins. Higgins, okay, yeah. Cool. I hadn't heard anyone mention that before. That's a oh. beautiful building. Well, yeah. you know, Tommy Cork, who is the principal at DIQ that's leading this project, um, is from Worcester, and it's a building he had always admired. And uh, I think it's become a little bit cliche to do baseball parks with red brick, and we felt like Worcester was a steel town, and it would be a nice reference point and a good way to create something that's very distinctive for this city. Is that the first thing you're looking for in a situation like that? To find something that, that's sort of the point to build, to start building things around? Well, I think architects always look for moments of inspiration. And I would, uh, I certainly Tommy Quirk can speak for himself, but I think that this idea of, of the steel was a very early and crystal uh, clear thought in his mind of the right kind of vocabulary to use. And I think as he's come to know the site better, uh, that the team has really embraced this notion of allowing the contours of the land and the sort of craziness of this drop that occurs from Plymouth Street down to Madison Street, allowing that to guide the field dimensions and the way the seating bowl is set up. Do you, do you remember, I'm sure you do, when you first saw the site and had you, what was your familiarity with it before you actually got kind of on the ground and looked at it? I didn't know anything about it until I got here. <laughs> Uh, you know, my first trip to Worcester was uh, my first real introduction to the city, too. And it was interesting to see this site because it was uh, exactly as presented. Uh, you know, a, a once thriving industry in the heart of the city, gone. Uh, you know, gone because industry changed um, and gone because our world has changed. And it was, it, it was so much fun to see the Canal District and how it has grown up very organically and to see the way downtown has been uh, has changed and you, you can see even though I've only known this city for a very short time you can see the layers uh, of the the generations here and sort of appreciate how it has evolved and we love the idea of using the baseball park and the associated development that uh, Dennis Dowell and Madison Properties will do to really knit the two together. When was your first trip to Worcester? Oh, if I was Charles Steinberg, I would be able to tell you exactly oh, the yeah. date Probably and the down time. In the I know. I, I, I'm sorry. I can't do that. It was, uh, it was after the postcards. Yeah. Okay. Um, but I came to one of the first meetings where we met with the mayor uh, and had a tour of the city and met with your city manager. And uh, we're, we're very impressed at the outset with not only the site and the opportunity, uh, but also with the professionalism of this, the city and the staff here and just their approach to uh, doing business and putting this together. Mm -hmm. You mentioned Worcester and, and the, the industry having left. How much research do you do on a city just to feel like that you, you can feel it a little bit, to, to feel like you understand the city when, when you're starting to, to create those concepts? Well, um, I guess we all look at it different ways, but as a as a student of cities and a, you know, li literally a student of urban planning, I'm very familiar with how cities in the Northeast grew up and how important the industry base and the mills and the water, the presence of water in the trains. And you, you see a pattern uh, in the Northeast and Worcester's very much sort of that formula. So it's fascinating to read the history and see how it fits together, but it's not terribly different from other cities along the, the Blackstone Valley. And, um, how the industry evolved around uh, around that river and yet how it changed over time. And, uh, cities changed with it and of course you've got the benefit of being just a stone's throw away from Boston and its robust economy and the commuter train that takes you there and 
I-90 if you can stomach it. So you know, <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a really nice, nice. How, how much time did you spend just spend in the city to, to try to just to, to sort of match what you read with what you were, could observe? Well, my favorite <clears throat> time in the city is the unorganized time. We've certainly had wonderful tours and um, many introductions to lots of, um, of your, your very civic-minded community, and, uh, and yet maybe the time I've enjoyed the most has been just the easy walks down Green Street and uh, the time we spent just getting to know our site in particular and understand sort of how this elevation change is going to impact the ballpark in a significant way. And Larry Lucchino has always been very interested in um, any project we've taken on, how we include the community. And uh, this community so lively and active and engaged that it's it's been a real joy. Yeah. Are you carrying like a notebook? Are you taking pictures? What what what? What's I your, don't have what a notebook your... like Dr. Charles Steinberg has <laughs> a notebook. If that's what you're wanting, I do have a notebook actually. I have a notebook. I have a show and tell that might sure. be. Uh, this is my oh, notebook. Cute. Nice. This is my uh, my way of keeping up with what's going on at Polar Park. Um, but I don't uh, I I don't have the chronicle of the. Uh, 500 plus uh, comments that Dr. Shaw. Oh, I just more about like for you as you're walking along and you see something that sparks this in your mind. Are you are, is, what's your sort of is it you keep this straight in your memory? Is there do you, are you oh. is there crazy notes someplace? Well, or? I'm sort of bad about using my camera as my note taker. I you know I think those of us who uh, have a, a a heavy quadrant of the visual um, gene. Uh, I have rely on the camera a lot. I, my son asked me the other day, he said, do you look at all those pictures? I'm like, yep, I sure do. <laughs> yeah, I sure do. I sort them by signs. I sort them by trees. I sort them by uh, paving materials. I sort them by cities. You know, it's, uh, it's a fun way to document things. Was there one thing you took a picture of that, that's, that, you, that you remember that you'll go back to a bunch of times that you've done this that just, that, that stands out that says... That that struck you, and you could you started like that was a seed in a way that, that you built other things off of. No, I would say that the that the thing that's probably been top of mind for me um, is has been the city grid. You've got some beautiful maps of Worcester, and I love I always love going over to Birch Street Grid and looking at the maps that are hanging on their walls and the the evolution of the city. And so one of the most important things for us in this project was to look at the city grid and to think of how we could use the city grid to reunite the canal district in downtown and the two sides of Kelly Square. And uh, as you know from the Polar Park plans and the early work we did with Sasaki, uh, the idea of extending Plymouth Street across to create a front door for the office building that will sit north of the ballpark and continuing Summit Street down uh, is a very, a very important organizer for the site. And they, I, I hope, tell you a lot about our attitude about urbanity, uh, that we didn't just want to uh, land the ballpark there and try and create a ballpark first and then see how it fit in, but rather to sort of use the streets and the city grid as the organizing principles for how we approach Polar Park. In your, in your mind, do you sort of walk to the park or walk through um you know, how accessible it is and how do you approach that in terms of like really getting your head around like, okay, I'm coming from downtown, how am I getting to the park? Well, I think the hardest part um, is thinking about those elevation changes. And I think the other part that's challenging is the walk itself is fairly easy and obvious. And um, I walked from there over here today, but made a deliberate um, effort to walk along Madison Street. And uh, it's a reminder that the work that you're, you're doing on your city sidewalks is ever so important to the walkability. Um, just because as the crow flies, it's short and obvious doesn't mean that it feels obvious when you've got two feet on the pavement. So I appreciate how much effort the city is putting into the sidewalks, the street trees, uh, the, the lamping, uh, 
the thought that we've had about making these underpasses feel like something really special rather than something scary. Uh, that, that's scary. <laughs> and uh, they're, they're beautiful, uh, but not everyone would see them that right. way. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, that's interesting because I think there is there is kind of a mental block, and, and I've walked from here to the ballpark site before, and you, you do it, and it's like, oh, it's actually pretty walkable, but you don't think that it is no. until you do it. No, that's so, right. Like, yeah. how do you bridge that gap for the public? Yeah. To, you know? What has surprised you about Worcester so far in your research of the city? I think the history of it is just amazing. We're always hearing of some new first in Worcester, <laughs> like how did Worcester become home to all these first? Uh, but that's really fun, I think, that it's first to so many serious things and, you know, like uh, the space suit and first to so many playful things like what's a smiley face and the calliope. So uh, we've enjoyed that part, I think. Mm -hmm. So you're still in the design phase, but you know, of the things that you've been observing in Worcester and the things that make Worcester special, what are some of the must-have features that you want in the ballpark? Well, I think we must have a calliope, right? <laughs> and I'm sure we'll have a smiley face. And the heart, we love the way your city streets embrace the heart. And I don't think you ever get out of the design phase. I think that's one of the things we all enjoy about this project so much, or projects like this, is that you start with urban planning and those principles, and uh, and you you end with your the presentation of graphics on your scoreboard and how people engage with it, and those things are ephemeral and they change over time. So, I think we're we're sort of always in a design phase. We're always looking. Uh, to evolve and to respond to, to our audience. And I think it'll be a lot of fun when we start playing baseball here to see how fans react. And we don't have any real sense of, um, of how that the, the personality of the crowd will change from night to night. I mean, we expect there'll be some times during the course of the baseball season that the presence of the colleges will be uh, where the accent is. And there'll be other times where the rich family life is sort of the, the evident in the number of kids that will be there. So we've tried to think about all of those audiences and the way that we present things and hope that we can feel like home to many of them. Mm -hmm. Is the minor league park different doing it for on the, on the smaller scale? It is, and it's different, I would say, in two ways. Um, one is that as, as a minor league team, you're not in control of your destiny. So you can't, not that major league teams can ever sure. count on winning either, but uh, minor league teams are, are always looking to make certain that there's more surrounding the game than the game, since uh, their best players may well wind up um, you know, being plucked out during the course of the season. Uh, and then I also think it's different because in a smaller scale project, you can afford to think literally about everything. And, uh, and we, we love that. You know, having worked for Larry Lucchino uh, several times now, I, I know that he relishes the chance to have all of us think about things that uh, are memorable. And, uh, you know, Camden Yards, which was the first project that I did with him in Baltimore, uh, today you don't think so much about the big, the big statements that were made by saving the warehouse and the creation of Utah Street as a concourse inside the ballpark as you think about uh, the little things like the uh, like the the insignia in the end standard of the seat or the uh, flags that are on the flag court that note the teams in descending order they're standing and it's just fun to have these things in baseball that because there's no clock and because there's nine innings of leisurely time to kind of get to know the fans around you, the players in front of you, and the park you're in, um, I think it gives us a rationale to want to put more stories in our architecture than perhaps you would with a library or a city hall or um, a school.